This episode is brought to you in part by Aria North. You too can become part of the show right now, today, at drunkonriding.com. It's one of those things that inevitably comes up among drinks or as one of the worst security fields known to man. What is your favorite movie? And unlike what's your favorite song or what's your favorite book, I've had the same go-to movie for years now. And no, I do never pick this as a security field. The easy answer? Office Space, released February 19th, 1999 and sort of a box office bomb, making just $12.2 million off of a $10 million budget, likely due to a lackluster and somewhat confusing poster and marketing campaign. But now, a cult classic. Thanks in part probably to Comedy Central airing the movie almost endlessly over the years. First debuted back in 2001 and had about 1.4 million viewers. Was I one of them? Maybe. I don't know. It was a while ago, so I don't really remember. But I do know that Comedy Central was the first place I ever saw Office Space. And uh, at this point, I've probably worn out my DVD copy of it, one of more than 6 million copies sold in the U.S. alone. But why am I doing a dissection on Office Space now? What, what makes it all of a sudden uh, a topic that I want to tackle? Well, the answer is uh, actually surprisingly easy. Yeah, I saw this beer, Trinity Brewing's Red Swing Line, and I just had to buy it. You know, I, I saw it on the shelf and I was like, what is this? And I just went and picked it up. It's actually one of several office space themed beers that the brewer puts out, including these other ones. TPS Report, O-Face, and damn, it feels good to be a gangsta. I feel like I, I probably need to get all of them at some point, maybe somewhere down the line. But but Trinity Brewing actually signed a deal with ACCO Brands Incorporated, or is it ACCO? I don't know. Whoever makes the Swing Line Stapler to be able to have this beer called this and feature a red Swing Line on it. Sidebar. They didn't actually make a red Swing Line Stapler at the time the Office Space was released. They made that specifically for the movie. It was a uh, part of the prop department. They, they painted a regular swing line stapler red. But ACCO or ACCO brands, they, you know, realized what was up after so many people called trying to find that stapler. And eventually, years later, they started making a red swing line stapler, which is why I happen to have one on my back shelf right now. Yes, I bought that going into this dissection. And yes, it's going to stay there. And yes, I friggin' love it. Now, this beer, though, a Sour Session IPA aged in French oak Chardonnay barrels. And if you read the label like I'm about to do, it says, Brewed with three heavily fruity hops, coriander, and tangerine zest, the profile is definitively American in focus. And it goes on from there. But the reason I wanted to read that is because of that coriander bit, which, if you didn't tell by the emphasis, I taste almost nothing but coriander in this beer, which is it's a weird taste to kind of build a beer around. But it's it's not bad. It's I gotta say, I like this. And it really makes me want to try those other office space themed beers. Like, where do I get those? This is the first time I've ever seen this beer. And I had to pick it up. So if you see this, pick it up. If you see any of the office space beers, please send them my way. I would love to taste them, to have them on it, to do to have another reason to watch Office Space, like I need a reason. I think I've seen it like 50 times. But speaking of the movie, we should actually probably talk about it, shouldn't we? But before we do, there is something we should probably talk about first. Or should I say someone? If you've ever actually seen Office Space, it might not surprise you to learn that it was based on a cartoon, or rather a series of them centered around the character Milton. A series created, written, drawn, and voiced by Mike Judge, who you might know from a little series called Beavis and Butthead, or maybe King of the Hill, or even perhaps Silicon Valley, and who also wrote and directed Office Space, which is, you know, why I bring him up here. 
Now, these Milton shorts, which all follow the, the squirrely kind of nutcase of a character named Milton Waddams, and feature who would eventually become Bill Lumberg in the movie, were the first things that Mike Judge ever animated. The first episode appeared on MTV back in 1991, and the second, third, and fourth episode, and I think there were only four, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I was only able to find records of four, they aired on Night After Night with Alan Havey and on SNL. And Mike Judge says he based the character of Milton on a guy that he knew at an engineering job of his. Judge described him this way in an office space retrospective. He was kind of an odd guy. If I recall, he had a mail order bride from, I think, the Philippines. No one ever talked to him, and one day I was just kind of bored. I went over and just said, you know, hey, how's it going? And he just launched into this thing about how he was going to quit because they moved his desk three times. Sounds rather familiar, doesn't it? I told, I told Bill that if they move my desk one more time, then, then, I, then I'm quitting. By the way, Mike Judge described that job as god-awful. He had to alphabetize purchase orders for eight hours a day. And he couldn't wear any headphones or even talk to anybody because he says he would lose his place. So you can kind of see the the beginnings, the workings of office space in there, right? That kind of that kind of symbol of the life sucking, oh brain draining, oh my god, I do not want to be here job, right? The the kind of thing that I've only ever seen better tackled in I think Joe versus the volcano. I, I, I can feel them sucking the juice out of my eyeball. Suck, 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 suck. <laughs> now, Office Space wasn't Mike Judge's first film. That honor belongs to the 1996 Beavis and Butthead Do America, which he wrote, produced, directed, and, of course, starred in. Now, that movie especially at the time, that, that, that this is a movie that I have a fondness for, though I haven't quite seen it in, in some time, but that movie was a huge success, at least comparatively. It made $63 million on a, about a $12 million budget. But again, Beavis and Butthead do America a cartoon, yet another cartoon. So what would make Mike Judge jump from cartoon to, to live action? Why would he make such a drastic change. Well, basically, his producers over at Fox sort of talked him into it. They had just had a hugely popular film with There's Something About Mary, which, again, that's a great film, even though uh, at the time that that came out, I heard incessantly, Warren, go find your baseball. <sighs> Made me hate that movie. But anyways, Fox wanted another big, broad comedy to follow up there's something about Mary. And for some reason or another, they saw the Milton cartoons and were like, yeah, that thing has potential. While that didn't quite work out, again, the movie was a box office bomb, it may help explain the film's cult status, you know, uh, why it is popular to this very day. After all, the Milton shorts gave an eye into the absurdity of work life. The absurdity of white-collar, cubicle, paper-pushing work life. The kind of life where, you know, taking a stapler from someone might make them burn the building down. Well, okay, but I'm going to set the building on fire. And, of course, Office Space would tap into this as well. More than that, I'd say, I mean, the the first third of this movie from, from that opening traffic jam... Through the, the corporate accounts payable, Nina speaking. Corporate accounts payable, Nina speaking. Just a moment. When I was younger, I always wondered why she was payable, Nina, because of the inflection, the way she actually said that. And there's actually a deleted scene about the inflection, Peter begging Nina to say her little line differently. And there, there are some people who theorize that the fact that she had endless calls from bill collectors, that's what account payable means, means that the, the company was hemorrhaging money. It's kind of uh, giving a clue into the company's downfall. But I digress. Uh, where was I? Uh, okay, so payable Nina to uh, the case of the Mondays. Uh-oh. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. And on to the TPS reports. 
Yeah, you apparently didn't put one of the new cover sheets on your TPS reports. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry about that. I, I forgot. Mm, yeah. Some of which I will touch on again a bit later, but all of this is such a perfect encapsulization of, of corporate life, corporate cubicle life, that, you know, despite loving office space for years, you know, I, I, since back in about mid-2000s, 15 years ago or so, it wasn't until I actually entered corporate cubicle life that I truly appreciated this film for what it is, for the brilliance that it is, for the absurdity that it beholds, you know? That and its brilliant characterization of employees who seem to just fail upward. You physically take the specs from the customer? Well... How do these people keep their jobs? I just don't understand it, and there's so many of them. Where do they come from? I don't know, it's frustrating. But getting back to actually adapting the film, it was Gary Cole, a.k.a. Lumberg, who actually sold Mike Judge on making the film in the first place. When Gary Cole came in and read, Judge said in that same retrospective I mentioned, that was a good day because I was on the fence about making the movie. He came in and read, and I was just like, if nothing else, if I get this guy on camera doing that character, that will be worth it. Which is interesting given Cole's take on Lumberg is basically a take on Mike Judge's take on the nameless, ro nameless character from the shorts. Is that all track? I think so. Here's how Gary Colt described the whole thing. My Lumberg was based on a ripoff of the cartoon, which basically was a ripoff of Mike Judge. So I went in and did my greatest attempt at an imitation of Mike Judge. Quick side note. John C. McGinley actually came in and read for the Lumberg role as well. And while Gary Cole would go on to win that role, McGinley would go on to play the oh-so-memorable Bob Slidell, who constantly looks like he's on the verge of throwing a table through the wall, and who will come up again, I'm sure. Now, what about Milton, though? Played oh-so-incredibly, exquisitely in the film by Stephen Root who was later added to the movie's poster for the home video release. Recently parodied for a Deadpool marketing campaign, actually. And who I think really, really understands what makes Milton so... Milton. I begged Mike to do one line that I came up with that I thought was the core of Milton's character, which was, and the squirrels, they were married. Which described two squirrels f***, but that's how he could explain life. I think Milton perceives himself as a perfectionist, and yet his outward appearance is slovenly. If you look at the tie, there's stains all over it. Probably the guy has two shirts and he wears them for days. He's an invisible nuisance who must be tolerated because he's a human on the planet. I think we all probably know at least one person who fits that description, right? I think I probably know more than one. But Milton, despite being the star of the shorts, despite being the namesake for the shorts, is not the star of Office Space, and that is completely by design. I didn't see a whole movie in just the Milton character, Judge said about this, because he's one of those types of characters where you kind of don't want to know what happens when he's at home. It's kind of funnier if you just get the tip of the iceberg, though he does still manage to get some of the movie's best scenes, several of which are pulled right from the shorts, like just verbatim, just taken, and just remade in live action. But for the film, our protagonist becomes Peter, played by Ron Livingston, though the role was offered to Ben Affleck. Can you just imagine what that would have been like? But but Ron Livingston's Peter, he's pretty much the definition of the everyman living corporate life. I mean, he would be the guy sitting at his desk playing Bejeweled nowadays instead of working. You know, he, he's so over his job that when he's asked what he does, the very first thing he says is, I sit in a cubicle. But I think, you know, to talk more about Peter, to really delve into him, I think we have to start talking about... While researching for this dissection, I came across a short little note 
uh, referencing the similarities between Office Space and the 1853 Herman Melville short story, Bartleby the Scrivener, A Story of Wall Street. So naturally, I had to give it a read. Now, the story, unlike Office Space, is told from the perspective of the employer. And it's about an employee who decides he doesn't want to work anymore. When asked to do anything, really, including his job, his actual job, he just responds, I would prefer not to. You know, it's a problem of motivation. But the story, it's funny. It's its very comedic. It's, it's com completely absurd, but actually really well told, which I guess is to be expected from Herman Melville. But it ends really rather tragically with the employee just dying, like giving up. You know, he, he, he basically would prefer not to live. And that ending, what it did was it actually made me go back through the story and kind of dig back through the details. And it was interesting what I, what I kind of discovered there was Bartleby, who is, who is the employee, the space in which he works is this tight little corner of the office separated by a folding screen. And he's got a window, but the window looks out on a brick wall that is about three feet away from the window. There's a little bit of sunlight that comes down. So he, he is living in this little box, basically, and his job, which is Scrivener is not a job that's around it anymore, so I don't really expect you to know what it is. His job is to copy papers. That's all he does every day, all day. He copies papers. He makes sure that they're accurate. He has a mind-numbing job. You don't really need much skills other than being able to do something accurately and for hours on end. And he has no view. In fact, he seems to sort of be sitting in a cube of space of some sort. A cubicle, as it were. <gasps> And by all accounts, he's pretty much as depressed as they come. The guy gives up living. Yeah, so you can see the similarities between Bartleby and Office Space, the more modern Office Space. Especially when you take certain dialogue from the film, the certain dialogue exchange. Ever since I started working, um, every single day of my life has been worse than the day before it. So that means that every single day that you see me, that's on the worst day of my life. What about today? Is today the worst day of your life? Yeah. Wow, that's messed up. Peter, the one with the issues in that clip, and of course, our hero in the movie, he is suffering from the same malady that Bartleby did over a century earlier. He's working this job that he finds no personal satisfaction and no personal reward. Peter with fixing the Y2K bug, Bartleby with making copies. But I think it's there really that the similarities end because while Bartleby meets with this, this awful tragic end, Peter in deciding he no longer wants to work, he ends up getting rewarded. He gets a promotion. He gets stock options. He gets people reporting up to him and his hardworking fellow workers. And, you know, come to think of it, there are a couple workers in Bartleby the Scrivener, the short story, who do do their jobs, but they're also lazy. So this is not quite the same as Peter's co-workers in Office Space. But Peter's co-workers in Office Space, they end up getting fired. Michael, played by David Herman, and Samir, portrayed by AJ Naidu, they're out of here. They're seemingly good at their jobs, and yet they are fired. And Peter, who didn't really want to do anything at all, moves up the corporate ladder. Talk about failing upward, right? But this is the backdrop. This is the narrative drive for pretty much the second half of the film, almost the second two-thirds of the film, which never really lands as well as that opening, that first third, that first commentary-laden opening, you know, from from that traffic jam all the way through when he gets hypnotized, really, that, that shrink session that I showed you. That section is brilliant. It is perfection. After that, it is so-so. Though it is home, I will say this, to 
probably the movie's most iconic scene. So iconic, Ted Cruz, of all people, parodied it for a campaign commercial. The movie basically goes from an elongated episode of Seinfeld to, I don't know, something, something with a plot. You know, something not as fun. And you surely can't say that the ending comes off as a surprise. I mean, Milton lays the groundwork for this just 19 minutes into the film. Okay, Milton. And, oh, no, it's not okay because if they make me, if they, if they take my, my stapler, then I'll, I'll, I'll have to, I'll set the building on fire. Okay, well, that sounds, uh, sounds great. Office Space's entire plot is really secondary. It's, it's almost just a device to frame the cutaway skits and the character studies that exist throughout the movie. They're basically the live action argument for the success of Family Guy, which interestingly enough had just started airing when Office Space was released and which would go on to parody Office Space at one point. <laughs> But you know what? Despite the plot taking a bit of a downturn in the second half of the film, I think Office Space's whole setup is perfect. It's brilliant. And not only because it's a framework that other films, other books use all the time, but because it allows Office Space to give us some of the most memorable moments I have ever seen put on a film. Let's take a look. It all starts with that opening crawl of traffic. A scene that parodies an almost daily occurrence that every single worker has experienced at one point or another, which is probably why it was used so heavily in the original film trailer, albeit with a very different soundtrack. In fact, the whole movie almost had a very different soundtrack because the producers over at Fox, the producers of Office Space, really weren't into all the rap that Mike Judge would use in the film. Thankfully, several focus groups did like the rap, and we have the mastery that is the soundtrack today as it is. But that opening, it's heightened with such scene stealers as, as the dude with the walker. Samir's frustrated, angry inability to even get a swear out. Son of a ass. And Michael's hypocritical racism. We standing up for our own it was filmed in both Dallas and Austin and reminds me a lot, though I don't think it's an homage to Falling Down, a much darker comedy than Office Space but home to probably the best ever seen filmed inside of a fast food joint. Turn around, look at that. You see what I mean? It's, it's plump, it's juicy, it's three inches thick. Now, look at this sorry, miserable, squashed thing. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this picture? The first time you see the TPS report scene, you have no idea what to expect. It's just a, a boss coming over to give a, a friendly reminder about a new policy, right? You see, we're putting the cover sheets on all TPS reports now before they go out. Did you see the memo about this? Yeah. Innocuous enough, even if the boss, Lumberg, doesn't really pay attention to Peter, the employee, in any way, shape, or form at all. Rather typical, actually. But then, it happens again. Hi, Peter. What's happening? We need to talk about your TPS reports. And the frustration, the absurdity of middle management starts to come into the fold. But wait, here's the kicker. A telephone call, his phone rings, Peter's phone rings after the other manager walks away. And no, no, this phone call couldn't have anything to do with the TPS reports. Could it? Peter Gibbons. Yes. I have the memo. Of course, this joke would carry on through the movie with, with Peter mentioning he has eight bosses who come to him every time he makes a mistake and culminates in Lumberg's interview with the efficiency consultants. Yeah, Bill, let me ask you a real quick question here. 
how much time would you say you spend each week dealing with these TPS reports? And as for what a TPS report actually is, well, the jury's still kind of out at that one because we've gotten several different answers. At the 10th anniversary screening of Office Space, for instance, Mike Judge said that they stand for Test Set Program Reports, okay? But in the DVD extras for Office Space, it's revealed that TPS actually stands for Totally Pointless Shit, when in reality, they can actually stand for Testing Procedure Specification Reports. So that's a, it's a QA thing. Personally, I like the second option. It's established really early on that one of our protagonists, Michael, really hates his full name, Michael Bolton. Yeah, well, at least your name isn't Michael Bolton. You know, there's nothing wrong with that name. There was nothing wrong with it until I was about 12 years old and that no talent ass clown became famous and started winning Grammys. It's funny and it's timely, but it isn't until much later on in the movie that the brilliance of what seems to be kind of a little throwaway scene, a little throwaway bit, is fully realized as the efficiency consultants, who, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to call them the Bobs from here on out, because it's a lot easier to say. They turn out to be some of the singer's biggest, wildest, most craziest fans. So when Michael says to them, you can, you know, just call me Mike, it doesn't go over too well for him. You know, you, you can just call me Mike. I also want to point out that Michael in this film is the only one to break the fourth wall and actually interact with the audience after the temp says, hello, which I never really caught until recently. It was a recent watching of it that I, I realized what she had said. Um, but the scene actually inspired a Funny or Die video uh, a few years back that featured the real Michael Bolton, who is digitally inserted into several office space scenes, with the only thing he changed being calling himself an extremely talented ass clown. My favorite scene in all of office space and the inspiration for my shirt is probably also the most cathartic. The moment when Michael, Samir, and Peter take this godforsaken printer that is causing such pain in their lives and bring it out into the middle of the field and summarily execute it. That's truly what this scene is, an execution, co complete with a bat, fisticuffs, and an amazing accompanying soundtrack. Now, don't get me wrong, I've beaten up a printer before, true story, but this, this is something on a completely different level. It's so well done that AJ Naidu, the guy who plays Samir, said that so-called mobsters have come up to him and said, I like the way you did that printer and it was very authentic. Like my, my take on a little accent there, I, I thought it was pretty good. And honestly, I think it's rather deserving. It deserved that punishment. Now, I hate printers. Printers are the bane of modern technological existence. They are the worst thing. They're the reason why we have electronic mail now, so we don't have to print anything out. Oh my God, why don't they ever work? But this printer in particular deserved it because it actually interrupted and changed a scene. Yeah, the PC low letter scene not scripted. So you're missing the point. The point of the exercise is that you're supposed to figure out what you would want to do if... PC load letter? What the f*** does that mean? Michael was supposed to say more, but the paper jammed and interrupted him with that little incessant beeping, and he ad-libbed hysterically. I loved it. I loved that whole scene. By the way, PC load letter? means that the printer ran out of or did not recognize the paper in the tray. Uh, it's not something that we see nowadays, but it was on those older printers. So yeah, there you go. We get a few dream sequences throughout Office Space, particularly in the latter half of the movie, but there's one that really stands out for me. One that I 
never not laugh at. And of course, I think you probably know the one I'm talking about. The one in which Lumberg f***ed her. Now Lumberg. Not only do we get overly exaggerated takes on that quote and the O-face from the criminally underutilized Greg Pitts, we also get the, the haunting imagery of Bill Lumberg with Joanna just going at it, well, with Joanna's foot, I suppose, as he sits there and drinks his cup of coffee and just harangues Peter for his... TPS reports. Peter, what's happening? Um, could you give me those TPS reports ASAP? Fun fact, Mike Judge actually added the coffee mug in at the very last second. And it's pretty funny because, to me, it's really what makes this dream sequence stand out. It's just, yeah. And, you know, I think without the coffee mug, the scene would actually come off really creepy instead of hysterically funny that's just that scene Ugh. though most of the milton focused scenes are pulled directly from copied pretty much directly from the animated shorts there's one that that wasn't and it is actually the most anger inducing scene for me in all of Office Space. Of course, I am talking about Lumberg's birthday party. Happy birthday to you. The nonchalance of the now 41-year-old Lumberg, the as under-enthusiastic as you can possibly imagine singing, the, the, the happy birthday. The, I mean, it's so indicative of corporate culture that that whole scene is already a standout, but what makes this scene one of the best in the entire movie is the cake, or rather, the passing of the cake. I really, really appreciate it. It's very special. Now, Milton, don't be greedy. Let's pass it along and make sure everyone gets a piece. Payable Nina. I mean, if you didn't want to strangle her in the earlier part of the film, you definitely want to do it now. I mean, even after Milton says, last time I didn't get a piece, she still gets on his case about passing. Just pass it. And at the end, Milton does not get a piece. He gets completely screwed. And who is the woman next to him in the glasses? Look at her smug attitude as she simply pretends Milton no longer exists, standing right next to her. We have to burn her house down. There's an ongoing side plot throughout the film as Jennifer Aniston's character, Joanna, is repeatedly lambasted by her tchotchkes manager, played by an uncredited Mike Judge, apparently channeling a guy he saw at a Kinko's because he added the character too late to cast someone for not wearing enough flair especially as compared to her co-worker, Brian. <laughs> but it all ends with a great, big expression on Joanna's part. You know what? Yeah, I do. I do want to express myself. Okay, then I don't need 37 pieces of flair to do it. This whole bit works on several levels, and not just because tchotchkes means, uh, you know, small knick-knack or trinket, which is basically a synonym for flair, or that the bare minimum keeps coming up again and again throughout the movie, you know, doing just enough not to get fired, or that, you know, the, the, the we're not in Kansas anymore. Not even that tying into the movie's theme, but because this is a commentary on an actual practice that was taking place at that time at TGI Fridays, one the movie through Peter compares to the Nazis. And even though the set was actually the Alligator Grill in Austin, Texas, which sadly closed back in 2009, the reference wasn't lost on TGI Fridays, and the restaurant ended up, you know, uh, getting rid of its flair by 2005. They come to Tchotchkes for the atmosphere and the attitude. Okay, that's what the flair is about. It's about fun. Yeah. Now, all of these scenes are well and good 
In fact, I'd go so far as to say they're great. But I've watched Office Space dozens of times, and there are things I still just did not know about this movie. Some of the Easter eggs I stumbled on while researching this video, I frankly find astounding. I don't know how I never picked up on them, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. So, you know, let's take a look at some of the ones you might have missed. Peter and Lawrence live in Morningwood Apartments. I guess this is somewhat appropriate given Lawrence's introduction. Check this out, dude. But it could be a reference to Beavis and Butthead. Maybe there's like a morning wood fairy, you know, like the tooth fairy. <laughs> and the same might be said for a quote from Lawrence later on in the movie. Watch out for your cornhole, bud. Which very clearly sounds like... I am cornhole I need TV for my bunghole! Despite being the definition of boring, everyday, monotonous cubicle life, the statue in front of Inatech tries to show the company as a bit more unique. It depicts a square peg punching through a round hole. Both of the efficiency consultants, the Bobs, are wearing medical ID bracelets. Maybe they've had too many heart attacks? And while we're with the Bobs, the whiteboard in the back as they meet with Peter shows the most complicated flowchart you've ever seen in your entire life, with the simple title, Planning to Plan. One final bit with the Bobs. After Bill Lumberg's meeting with them, he gets silently demoted. You can see it on the plaque for his parking space immediately in the next scene, though his office door still says Division Vice President at the end of the movie, so there's a chance this might just be a continuity error. And finally, Bill Lumberg's large gold class ring? That was originally a prop for the show Crusade, in which Gary Cole played Captain Matthew Gideon and wore it in every single episode. Office Space just so happened to be the first project Cole worked on after Crusade's cancellation. I want to talk about the ending of the movie, but first... Okay, well, uh, so when, when Office Space was, was first released, the, one, of, one of the marketing campaigns asked people and invited people out to select screenings to beat up office equipment, which I'm sure didn't confuse anyone at all. There was even a marketing campaign to report your Lumberg-like uh, horrible managers. And while this all might seem just like marketing hoo-ha, in the years since Office Space's release, it's been shown that, you know, Office Space really kind of tapped into this, this primal, simmering rage within the white-collar worker community. Both Mike Judge and Ron Livingston have talked about people coming up to them in the year since and telling them about these jobs that they just hated, that just felt like they, they were just getting their, their life sucked out of them, that they were just miserable in, and they ended up quitting thanks in part to the influence of office space. They, they left to find something that they actually enjoyed. But maybe, maybe they wouldn't have felt so inspired if a certain scene hadn't been cut from the movie. At the end of the film, we finally see Peter make good on his, you know, perhaps man wasn't made to sit in a cubicle, kind of, you know, his tirade that he had somewhere in, in the middle of the movie. And he gets this new job working outside, working with his hands, shoveling debris, shoveling de the debris of Inatech, actually. Now, I've worked jobs like that, and I do have to say, there is something rewarding about having a tangible, visible reflection of the work that you're putting. You know, this is not something that's digital. It's not on a computer. This is something right before you could, you start off with like this mountain of dirt and you end up with a nice clean area that you've been, you know, shoveling and working and, and getting all nice and dirty and you get all grimy and your bones ache and your muscles ache. But the, there's like the sense of satisfaction. You did something here, right? But it's still work. 
it it kind of goes against the whole point of the movie, doesn't it? Peter said over and over he wants to do nothing. And what is he doing now? He's probably doing more work now than he did before. He can't play Tetris anymore. He can't space out for an hour and then hide in the bathroom. There's none of that. He's outside shoveling, doing construction work. He is going to be tired at the end of his day. And like I hinted, there's a deleted scene that, that really shows that despite the fact that he changed job, he might feel a bit more rewarded not a lot has really changed for him. Yeah, if you guys could just go ahead and sort of pick up the pace a little bit, that'd be great. Mike Judge apparently does not like the way the movie ends. He's said a few times now, in fact, that he wishes he could rewrite the final third or so of the film. And I get it, like I've said, throughout this, that's really where the movie takes a bit of a downward turn and doesn't really reflect the beginning, the, the greatness that is there, the, the, the commentary-laden kind of scenery that we have at the beginning. But what would that ending have been? You know, I reached out to Mike Judge on Twitter, hoping for some sort of uh, nugget of gold here, but he never responded to me, it was pretty typical. But would it have been maybe closer to Bartleby's fate? Would Peter have simply done nothing at the end? Would he have gotten the money if that was the way that the movie continued to go? I don't know, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a curious thought. And Mike Judge was offered the chance to follow up Office Space with a sequel once the movie started doing gangbusters on DVD and it pr proved to be, you know, a cult classic. It was, uh, the sequel was tentatively titled Office Space 2 Still Renting. So maybe we would have gotten some answers there. You know, there is still a possibility that we see it some point down the line. Mike Judge still very much a creative fellow. The key players in the film still around. Ron Livingston, I'm sure he'd be down for an, an Office Space sequel. The dude's great. And he, I mean, everybody seems to love the fans love the attention, love this movie. You know, maybe maybe it'll be a Netflix original one day. I think I think maybe there's hope. And you know, I would be turning into it day one. Oh, if only. But this has been Drunk on Riding's dissection of Office Space. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And I hope if you haven't seen Office Space yet, that you go out and correct that wrong. Or if you have seen it, and maybe you don't think it's as classic as it truly is, you go and you give it another try. Could it? Because it is, it is, it is fantastic. It is my favorite movie of all time. My favorite comedy of all time. And you know, it's nine. 30 right now and i might just watch it after this just to uh just to have something to do yeah i think i might so uh you know if you enjoy this please be sure to give it a thumbs up please give me a comment below please share it tell all your friends the channel could use the support and uh if you really liked it head on over to drunkonwriting.com and uh you know subscribe and sign up there to help the channel grow uh until next time as always Cheers. I don't have much beer left. And keep on riding.